And now, the Mole Mystery Theater, presented by M-O-L-L-E. Mole, the heavier brushless shaving cream for tender skin. This is Jeffrey Barnes, welcoming you to the program that presents the best in mystery and detective fiction. The story I have selected for tonight's program was received with so much acclaim when we first presented it last year that we are bringing it to you again this evening. It is a story that deserves to be ranked with the greatest classic mystery stories of all time. Thomas Burke's The Hands of Mr. Ottermore. It concerns a Jack the Ripper sort of character who in the year 1890 terrorized the city of London with a series of brutal murders. Arnold Moss, star of the recent Broadway presentation of The Tempest, will narrate. Uh, pardon my ignorance, Mr. Barnes, but what is a Jack the Ripper sort of character anyway? Well, Dan, he's a fellow who just can't help murdering. Oh, I know, like a man with tough whiskers or a tender skin. You know, he can't help murdering himself every time he shaves. That is, unless he uses Mole, the heavier brushless shaving cream. Yes, sir, man, with Mole, it's smooth. So smooth. It's slick. So slick. It's a smooth, smooth, slick, slick shave you get with M O L L E. Mole, the heavier brushless shaving cream for tender skin. That's right. Mole is the cream you need if you have a wiry, hard to cut beard or a tender skin. Because it is heavier, Mole not only softens your whiskers, it stands them up straight, lets your razor take them right off. So you get a smooth, slick shave every time. Yes, you shave faster, closer, easier, and you shave painlessly with Mole, the heavier brushless shaving cream for tender skins. And now for tonight's Mole mystery starring Arnold Moss, The Hands of Mr. Ottermore. ever thought you might like to kill someone? Have you ever thought someone might like to kill you? Not murder for the usual motives, you understand. Not murder for greed or hate or frustration. But a killing without reason, without motive. Murder of this kind happens so simply and so unaccountably. Two ordinary people are walking down the street, minding their own business, even as you or I, and suddenly, why, no one knows. One becomes a murderer, and the other becomes a victim. Take Mr. Wybrow, for example. Mr. Wybrow doesn't know it, but he's about to be murdered. Oh, he's just an ordinary fellow. Mr. Wybrow walking home from work of a pleasant evening, strolling casually through the cobweb alleys of London's East End. It's the spring of 1890. And Mr. Wybrow has nothing more important on his mind than buying the evening paper. Evening, James. That's the report, Mr. Wybrow. Things are pretty quiet. No murders or anything in the papers, huh? Oh, one or two larcenies, but uh, no killing, sir. It's a shame they can't schedule a good murder every two or three weeks. Helps the sale of papers, it does. People sure likes to read about murder. For my part, I'm just as happy there aren't any murders. It's a good thing when people respect law and order. Well, here's your paper, Mr. Wybrow. I'll uh, see you tomorrow night. But murder isn't something you just read about in the papers, Mr. Wybrow. Murder is something that happens to people, something final and violent. And tomorrow night, other people coming home from work will find your name in the paper. And your death will help the sale of James's newspaper. For at this very moment, as you walk down Largo Street, a man has begun to follow you. This man following you, Mr. Wybrow, he isn't a bad man. In fact, he passes everywhere as a respectable man, as most criminals do. But the thought has come into his moldering mind that he'd like to kill someone. And being without conscience, he's going to do it. And then go home to tea. 
Yes, Mr. Wybrow, murderers do eat. The same sort of food you and I eat. Even the same sort of fish you've stopped in to buy on your way home from work in accordance with Mrs. Wybrow's instructions. Evening, Mr. Wybrow. What'll it be tonight? The missus thought a little addict would be nice. Oh. How's this one here, sir? Kind of small, but I guess it'll be all right. Uh, wrap it up for me, will you? Right away. Now you've got company, Mr. Wybrow. The man who's about to kill you is just coming into the same fish store. Uh, 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 uh. Don't turn away. Look at him. That's right. There's nothing unusual about him, is there? You've seen him before. Nice night, isn't it, Mr. Ottimo? Haven't seen you around in some time. I guess it's because I've been coming home from the shop earlier. Here's your attic, Mr. Wybrow. All wrapped and ready. Very speedy of you. Uh, just charge it, huh? I'll be in to pay you the first of next week. Oh, and good night to you, Mr. Ottimo. Quiet but friendly sort of fellow, your murderer, isn't he, Mr. Wybrow? Yes, it's a friendly world. So take your fish and leave the market and go on to your rendezvous with death. <laughs> Almost home now, Mr. Wybrow, but don't hurry so. Take a look around you. It's your last look at the world. And if you knew it, you'd look at it more closely. The more slowly you walk, the longer you'll enjoy the fragrant air of this evening, the longer you'll see the dreamy lamplight of little shops. Pause a minute before you cross Loyal Lane. Pause among the houses that shelter the useless and beaten of London's camp followers. Hear the music of the people in the streets. It's the last time, Mr. Wybrow, the very last time. Now, Mr. Wybrow, there's only a minute or two on earth left for you. You've turned into your own street now. Right behind you is your murderer. Listen. Can't you hear something in his footfalls? Can't you hear something that cries out, Beware, here comes death, here comes murder? No. No, there's no warning in footfalls. They're neutral. The foot of villainy falls with the same note as the foot of honesty. All right, Mr. Wybrow. Go into your house. Yes, it's me, all right. Did you remember to get the fish? I remembered, all right. Good. Put it on the table, then. I'll be ready with tea in just a minute. Oh, is that someone at the door, dear? Yes, dear. I'll answer it. Go away from that door. Don't touch it. Get as far away from it as possible. Go out of the back door. Run to the garden over the fence. Call the neighbors, but don't touch that door. For on the other side is death. Why, hello. I didn't expect to see you again tonight. Something wrong? Uh, come in. Here, I'll, I'll get a chair for you. I, I say, what are you doing? Just, what are you doing? Crane, is this all you've been able to find out about the Wybrow murder? As editor of this paper, I expect... Well, it's a baffling case, sir. There he was, strangled to death, and absolutely no one around who could have done it. Now, 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 Mr. Crane, somebody must have been there. Well, if you think it's so easy, let me be the editor for a while, and you be the reporter. Now, whoever did this murder disappeared like magic. Mr. Wybrow was seen by the neighbors to enter his house at the usual time. Now, there was a policeman at the end of the street. He saw no one else enter or leave the house, but suddenly screams were heard. 
Then the policeman's whistle. Well, the criminal must have got there some way. He couldn't just fly in and out. You better go over to police headquarters and see what they know. Yeah, very well, sir. Yes, Mr. Crane. It certainly is a baffling case. But this is only the beginning. Even now, Mr. Crane, as you're on your way to police headquarters, the killer you seek is stalking another victim. The murder of Mr. Wybrow has only whetted the appetite of our killer. He wants to try it again and again. For he's found pleasure in killing her. And his conscience doesn't bother him one little bit. As the curtain falls on Act One of tonight's Mole Mystery... A mysterious killer is at large on the streets of London, and where he will strike next, nobody knows. Why, Mr. Barnes, don't tell me you can't see a murder coming. Well, no, Dan, that's practically impossible. Not all the time. Why, some men can see murder coming every time they stand before the mirror to shave. And say, men, if that's how it is with you, chances are you have wiry whiskers or a tender skin. But you know shaving needn't be painful, not if you shave with Mole, the heavier brushless shaving cream. That's right. Mole is the heavier cream that gives you a smooth, slick shave. Because Mole is heavier, it not only softens your whiskers, it stands them up straight and lets your razor cut them off close and clean. With Mole, you shave faster, closer, easier, and you shave painlessly. Try it. See if you don't say, it's smooth. So smooth. It's slick. So slick. It's a smooth, smooth, slick, slick shave you get with M-O-L-L-E. Mole, the heavier brushless shaving cream for tender skins. And now this is Jeffrey Barnes returning you to Act Two of The Hands of Mr. Ottermole. Mr. Wybrow in London of 1890 was called the London Strangling Horror because it was something more than murder. It was motiveless, and there was an air of black magic about it. For no one had seen or heard the killer, but it was as though he disappeared into thin air. And now, as the sun fades and night deepens on a strange, dark street, the killer prowls again, and victim number two has run out of time. Now, oh, listen to that. I've no notion it's reached that hour. I've kept you out too late again, Jane. Oh, go on. No, it's you that should be getting to bed, what with your work to go to so early. Let's put you on the tram car here. I've only half a block to run home. You'll be all right? Oh, why shouldn't I? Only half a block to go home, really. But strangling the other oh, day. Oh, don't you worry about me. Oh, listen, here comes the tram car now. Oh, it's hard to say goodnight. I oh, know, but... I'll see you tomorrow. Don't forget, same time. Hurry up now. Get on board. Good night, Janie. Best love. Good night to you. Good night. That's your last goodbye, Janie. Your very last. For down the street in the shadow of the doorway is the strangler. Even as you walk down the street, his footsteps have begun to echo along with yours. Do you hear them, Janie? Nothing menacing about them, is there? Then why do you feel frightened all of a sudden? Why have you started to walk faster? Are you afraid of a pair of footsteps? Well, you're right to be afraid of them, so put your head down and run. Don't look back. Don't look back. Janie, don't stop. Don't even speak to him. What's wrong with me? I started to walk fast. Scared, I guess I was, but I don't guess anybody can be scared of you. <laughs> hey, what do you what do you think you're doing? Hey, what do you think you are anyway? Now, 
Now, see here, Constable McDonald. A young woman in the prime of her youth, brutally strangled and in front of her own home. I say it's right. My newspaper is demanding action. The strangler must be found. Then you find him, Mr. Crane. There's absolutely no clue. Once again, he's disappeared like a whiff of smoke. Don't worry. I'll find him if I have to spend the rest of my life doing it. It's only murder number two, Mr. Crane. There are to be more of these stranglings, and each will be committed at a time when the streets are empty of any perceptible or possible murderer. Wherever people meet, in the streets, market shops, they discuss the one topic, murder. They bolt their doors and windows at the first fall of dusk, and they yield to apprehension and dismay. For by the whim of one man with a pair of powerful hands, the structure of their daily life is shaken. You mark my words, Alf. It's them gypsies what's responsible for these murders. Them eastern fellas. They know plenty of tricks. I've heard sailors tell of how they make themselves invisible. How they have potions that make anything possible. The only way to stop these stranglings is to drive them gypsies out of London. And so panic, panic rules the population. And no one in London feels safe unless there's a policeman somewhere around. But... Policemen are only human, the same as the rest of us. It's possible to strangle a policeman, too. And then, then, where does safety lie? That's right. Victim number three is Constable McDonald, who stops to talk with an old friend. Hey! Oh, oh it's only you. Give me a start. All night long I've been walking this here deserted street. Every once in a while, a stranger approaches the same as you've done. And I tighten my grip on my nightstick. I kept looking around so much, I've got a crick in the back of my neck. Maybe if you'd just run your hand over it a little, it could help some. Yeah, right here, that's where it helps. No, easy. Ah. Uh, here, here. What are you doing? Let go of me. London strangling horrors reach three. They're almost over. But there's to be one more, one more. And no one is ever to know the identity of the murderer. That is, no one but two men. The murderer himself and our young newspaper friend, Mr. Crane. And fate has a strange trick to play on Mr. Crane, as fate sometimes does. Sergeant. Oh, uh, uh Sergeant. Oh, evening, Mr. Crane. I've a uh, few questions I'd like to ask you, Sergeant. These three stranglings, uh, you discovered all of the bodies, didn't you? No, not exactly. I discovered Mr. Wybrow's body, and I discovered Constable McDonald's body. Uh, the girl, I, I got there just after she'd been found. You didn't uh, see anything? You didn't see anybody? I'll swear on my life, there was no one around. But how could the killer get away so quickly? Is it possible that he could have hidden right at the scene of the crime? No, sir. We went over every bit of the Wybrow's. No one could have hidden there. McDonald was killed in the street. No one could hide there, of course. As for the girl, it was unlikely anyone could hide nearby with a crowd around. That's what I want to know, Sergeant. Did a crowd form immediately after each murder? You know how people are, Mr. Crane. Let them hear a policeman's whistle and they all come running to see what's up. Do you think that has something to do with the murder, sir? Might have and it might not. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Sergeant. I'll, uh... I'll commend you to the inspector. These questions you're asking, Mr. Crane, what are they leading to? What idea is trying to shape itself in your mind? Do you think you're going to uncover the identity of the strangler? Men with more intelligence than you have been trying to solve it and failed. And the closer you come to finding out the killer, the closer you come to your own death, Mr. Crane. So don't think about it. Walk down the street, go into the music hall, where you can forget all these questions of murder. Mr. Crane, ham sandwich, 
in a glass of ale. Oh, just a minute, waiter. Look at this hair, why it's nothing but fat. Well, I didn't make the sandwich, sir. Oh, now look here. Are you trying to tell me that this establishment isn't responsible for its food? After all, the ham is there. Somebody had to put it there. Just didn't fly in by itself and... By George, that's it. That's what, Mr. Gray? Hey. Oh, oh, it's you, Mr. Editor. Sit down. I think I've solved the mystery of the strangling murders. What? What, then? Yes. I just saw a vision in my ham sandwich. A vision? How did the ham get into this sandwich? Oh, you fool. Somebody put it there. Precisely. And three persons have been strangled. Therefore, somebody had to be there to do it. Ah, uh, you have a genius for the obvious. Yes, and it's obvious the only way the murderer could escape was either by running away... Yes. ...or by standing still. Standing still? Standing still, so he wouldn't be conspicuous. Uh, here, here, wait a minute. Where are you going? Out into the street, sir. Out into the street to discover the man who could stand still the best. <laughs> This is Jeffrey Barnes again. In just a moment, we'll bring you Act Three of The Hands of Mr. Ottermore. When you have dandruff, you might just as well try to combat it with plain water as with many ordinary hair preparations. For such products, simply remove loose dandruff, and you can do that with plain water. To do more, to fight dandruff effectively, use double dandrine. For double dandrine is a scientific product that does what most ordinary hair preparations can't do. It goes to work on your scalp and actually kills on contact the germ that many outstanding authorities contend is a cause of a common type of dandruff. Even in severe cases, results with double dandrine have been remarkable. Now, the reason for double dandrine's astonishing effectiveness is that it contains a special ingredient called Alzan, an active antiseptic so amazingly efficient many hospitals use it. So stop trying to combat dandruff with preparations that can't compare with double dandrine. If you're not completely satisfied, return the empty bottle and get your money back. Buy Double Dandarine at your druggist. Your ham sandwich has told you a good deal about the strangler, Mr. Crane. You're getting very close to him now. As you leave the music hall and think over and over to yourself... Who can stand still best and attract the least attention? The answer comes to you. Why are you being so heroic, Mr. Crane? You're on a dark, lonely street now. It isn't necessary for you to bring the murderer in single-handedly. Look. There's a police station across the street. Run over to get help. No? All right, then. Go on by yourself. Be a hero. Snuff out your own life merely to prove that a vision you saw in a ham sandwich is the correct one. Go ahead. Turn the corner now and confront the strangler. Good evening. Oh, good evening, Mr. Klein. Have you dug up any new evidence about the murder since I spoke to you the other day? No, nor has anyone else. Really? Now, as man to man, tell me why. Just why did you kill all those innocent people? Holy Sergeant Otomo. God, you can't believe I did it. It couldn't be anybody else. You were present or nearby when each of the bodies was found. There wasn't time for anyone to escape the scene of the crimes. Therefore, the strangler escaped by standing still. God. And who could stand still? Who could be more inconspicuous in a crowd than a policeman? Than you, Sergeant Otomo. You think that's pretty clever, don't you? Well, you won't tell anybody about this. Stand back. I thought you might get rough, so I brought along this gun. Try anything and I'll use it. All right. Don't worry, then. I'm not going to try to get away, Mr. Crane. I know when the game's up. But there's still one thing I've got to know. Why? Why did you do it? I, I don't know exactly. I, but I've got an idea. Everybody knows we can't control the workings of our minds, don't they, Mr. Crane? So they say. That's right. Ideas come into our minds without asking, yet everybody's supposed to be able to control his body. Why? We get our minds from Lord knows where. Maybe from people dead a hundred years before we were born. Yes. Yes, go on. Well, might we get our bodies in the same way? 
Can't ideas live in nerve and muscle as well as in brains? Couldn't it be the parts of our bodies aren't really us? And couldn't ideas come into those parts all of a sudden? Not take my hands. Look at them. See how big and strong they are. Well, couldn't hands like these suddenly get the idea to choke things like this? I call me. I call you. I told you they get ideas, ideas to choke things. Excuse me, that gun, Mr. Klein. You're breaking my wrist. Drop that gun. Big beast. I shot you twice. Why don't you die? But it's my hands that strangle you, Mr. Crane. Oh. My hands. No. <laughs> 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 my hands. Mr. Next morning, two men were found in the same street. Mr. Crane, the reporter, Mr. Otomo, the police sergeant. But very much the same in one important respect. They were both very dead. Yes, and the strangler has been found out. But that's not the end. For fate still has its ironical prank to play on Mr. Crane. Poor Mr. Crane. Six months after his death, a proclamation was made by the Lord Mayor of London. Whereas the stranglings in London's East End suddenly and strangely came to a halt, it can only be concluded that the strangler died or was killed. In consideration of certain evidence, it has been decided that the strangler was undoubtedly a certain reporter named James N. Crane. And it is poetic justice of the most exalted kind that this strangler himself finally met his death by strangling. Therefore, I have ordered a special bronze medal struck in memory of the man who freed London of this horror and gave his life in so doing, Police Sergeant Ottomol. In memory of Police Sergeant Ottomol. <laughs> <laughs> Now, this is Jeffrey Barnes again, inviting you to be with us next week when we present Patricia Wentworth's In the Balance, starring Jim Amici. The original music for the Mole Mystery Theater is composed and conducted by Alexander Semler. The Hands of Mr. Ottermole was written by Thomas Burke and adapted for radio by L.K. Hoffman. Arnold Moss was featured in tonight's program. This is Dan Seymour saying good night until next Friday at this same time when the Mystery Theater presents In the Balance. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Mm.